channel devoted to all things avian. I'm Lev Perikian, the author of Why Do Birds Suddenly Disappear and the instigator of the Twitter Birdsong Project and a strictly amateur bird watcher. I'm joined as always by David Darrell Lambert, professional ornithologist and author of Bird Watching London. David, hi, how are you? Uh, yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. It's good. Okay, no, really, are hey, you? <laughs> Bird call impersonation. So you're all right. Good. That's good to hear. Was that uh, like a bitten's welcome? How are you? Oh, I love the bitten. I was, um, the first one I ever saw was uh, in, at Minsmere in the, the famous hide, the Island Mere hide there. And it was early in the morning and everybody was looking uh, in the other direction. The one person that, who was standing next to me just went bitten up, and I was, I was going like that, where, where? And then the, the, all I saw of it was just this thing flopping down into the reeds, and I said, was that it? Yeah, that was it. Okay, ticked it off, excellent, uh, that's terrific. Mine was also at Minsme, but I think I was by the West Hyde, by yeah. overlooking the scrape, and we walked out, and this bitten just came across the reeds quite high, flying, and we were like, Whoa! Just went bananas. There's extraordinary great. birds, extraordinary birds. Anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, I'd like to talk, one thing I'd like to talk about, because it's the first time that we've been forced indoors by the weather, is the weather. And what effect that has on birds and bird watching in general. Because I think certainly, and when I've started, I've uh, waited until the sun's shining and it's nice and warm, and I think I'll go for a nice walk and I'll be in the middle of the day and I'll see some lots of lovely birds. And I don't see as many birds as I'd hoped I would. Um, perhaps you could talk a little bit about that and how the weather in local terms will affect the, you know, the birds' behaviour and maybe time of day as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, the weather was really, really important. So if we just go to the two basic contrasts between the sunshine and like really wet weather, lots of rain, that sort of thing. It's obviously very important for them because they need to be able to drink. It's good for them to preen in as well. And it means that birds will react in a different way. So it may mean that if it's raining a lot and it suddenly stops, the birds will suddenly spring out. And in the, uh, in the summertime, they often burst into song. So it can be a really spectacular moment when that sort of thing goes on. Mm. The other thing as well with the rain is it brings all the insects down. So stuff like uh, swallows and martins and swifts, we fly much lower down. Yeah. So you can get really lovely views of them. And this was a really good if you were like on a reservoir because it sometimes brings down the migrants. So you can get really spectacular numbers of like turns moving through London, that sort of thing. Really, really, I like a bit of adverse weather because often when it stops, it, it feels really nice and sometimes you can get amazing views of birds because mm. having to go out and feed in, in these really bad weather conditions as well. And also there might be not quite so many people about as well because they're... Oh yeah, that's, that's always a bonus. Like that's me. a bonus as uh, well. It's certainly that, that I've definitely noticed uh, quite early on that that period just as the rain's stopping or just after rain is the time when there might be some flurry of activity and, uh, and, and of noise and you might suddenly be aware of things flying around. Uh, what about the cold um, when it's iced over? And we're talking of bitterns actually. Some of the best views I've ever had of bitten mm -hmm. were at the wetland centre in Barnes when the, the lake was iced over. And of course, they, had to, it, they came out onto the ice, out of the reeds where they might normally skulk. Um, and so for uh, you know, an hour or more, there were these fantastic views of this, this bird sort of sliding around like Bambi. Um, the, are there things that are there birds that love the cold more than warm weather, especially in the winter? Well, what normally happens is the cold weather isn't so great for the bird because it means often that their feeding isn't that much harder to do. So, like with the bit in the lakes are more frozen, so they're having to search different areas to try and eat, which means often in the urban area, because it's like two to three degrees warmer, less places are frozen. So, birds tend to come much more into your cities and places like that or into your garden. So if you're feeding birds in your garden, you get a massive flurry of activity when it's really cold. So it's important those times to make sure you've got constant food out for them and un, uh, frozen water as well. So they've got something uh, to drink as well. Nice. But yeah, you can get really nice views of birds as they have to come into the cities and they have to feed more because they need to obviously generate more heat in the cold weather. Uh, so we can get much better views of some birds. It's just 
you know, I used to like it because I used to see lots of unusual ducks and geese and mm. stuff that come in from the continent because yeah. they get pushed out of the really icy areas. But you've got to remember it's for the birds' welfare. And birds will perish in the cold weather. So it's nice, but it's sort of like a double-edged sword to it all. Yeah, and I think especially the smaller birds, which have more difficulty in retaining uh, body heat, will, will really s struggle in the very cold weather, won't they? Well, I, I remember reading about, uh, I think it was black the gulls, their beaks were freezing together because once they drunk water, it was then fr freezing up, and then they would starve to death because they couldn't open their mouth. So even for the larger birds, it can be quite difficult as well. I mean, if you're a very hardy species, like something like a snowy owl, then you know a bit of snow, they don't really give a monkeys too much. It's just part of the norm for them. Yeah, yeah. You know, we don't see many of them. I'd so, love to see some of them. I'd love to see one of those uh, in, in South London. Um, one of the <laughs> things I noticed, certainly that a couple of years ago, when we had that, uh, the Beast from the East, the, the, mm -hmm. the big late, it was in March, wasn't it? Late, was it? Yeah, beginning of March it was. Beginning of March. Um, and suddenly in our little back garden here, when we never see uh, anything, you know, uh, odd or untoward, that's the only time I've seen red wings and field fairs come to our garden. Uh, yeah. So I got the apples and put them out there for them, and they, they stayed for a day and a bit, the, the two field fairs and I think three or four red wings, and had a feast, and then of course they were off. But they, they were forced to go further afield for their, for their food, and I think they were probably taken by surprise, weren't they? Uh, like yeah, that. yeah, because normally we don't get such cold weather later on in the spring, and it was a real, real heavy cold snap. So I also put out apples to the thrushes as well. Yeah. And I admit um, uh, field fairs come down, but I have like three, and they were defending the individual apples. So if <laughs> one got too close to the other, they were going for each other, really. It was yeah. quite entertaining to watch. I can imagine. T tough for the birds, though. And um, which, of course, smoothly, we're so smooth with the segues on this because mention of <laughs> red wings and field fairs. Um, leads us to the thrush family, and that's going to be your ID. Although, are you going to do red wings and field fairs or not? No, we're leaving out the red wings. We're just going to do the, the summary stuff because yeah, otherwise, right. everyone's, everyone's going to be waiting for a red wing or field fair. Well, not, not, few months not, for that not, not, not yeah. until the autumn. So, mm -hmm. a, a bit of thrush ID because we quite often get these questions about um, what is this bird? Is it a song thrush or a missile thrush or? or a juvenile blackbird or whatever it is so um all uh, over to you for these excellent birds yeah well i love a bit of a, a thrush action i've got to say really nice species to get to grips with people often find the song thrush and mr thrush confusing both kind of brown both very spotted but i like to use very very simple way to id them so normally first up is uh, what i look for is what kind of coloration are they the song thrush always very warm brown looking uh, missile thrush much colder looking as well so mm -hmm. from a distance it's very easy to sort out just by using that and then if not I then start looking at the wings so on the song thrush they have a, like a really uniform wing if you get close you can see some nice intricate feather detail but on the missile thrush they have this real grey panel on them and that stands out like a sore thumb from miles away mm -hmm. and in fact I rarely go beyond these two ones. Would you, so if, if, if obviously you probably Got, got those two which are diagnostic but there's a difference in size as well isn't there and I think related to that a little bit is the kind of the the habitual postures that they might hold yeah I think the missile thrush has been quite an upright bird whereas song thrush a bit, bit more crouched and missile thrush is is bigger as well although size is difficult to tell from the distance it is, it's very hard to judge but their behavior like you say is quite Classic. So song thrushes tend to be stuck under bushes, under the foliage, very like, close to cover. Missile thrush is like a nice big open space of grass, and they sit right in the middle, bold upright, charging around the place. Very rare to see a song thrush outside from the undergrowth areas as well. Right, yeah, that's cool. Um, the other so I was going to just raise the question of the the spots on the front because the field guides that all of them I think will say oh look here the look at the difference between the the arrowhead ones on the song thrush and the non arrowhead yeah. ones. I always I certainly have always found that quite a confusing way of doing it. Um, yeah, well, you also need to be quite close, and you don't yeah. often get that close to song thrushes for certain. So I prefer talking about the actual neatness of them so like on a song thrush it looks like some artist has come across and just drawn in each one very very carefully mm -hmm. and then they used up so much energy when it came to doing a missile thrush they were like blah 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 blah, blah. <laughs> so for my eyes when i look at a missile thrush oh it's very messy on the spotting song thrush looks much neater and if you get close enough you can see that the song thrush has arrowheads 
and the missile thrush has got rounded spots. But to be honest, whenever I see them, I've never ever used the shape of the arrowheads. Yeah, also I found because actually, as it gets closer to the throat, I think the missile thrush uh, markings look a little bit arrowheady anyway, don't they? Yeah, they do. They do. They often have on the shoulder patch like yeah. a big blob of spots as well, which is sort of quite handy as well to use. Right. Um, but then I always the head. The head is a good one. Yeah. Where the missile thrush has a really pale head, really black eye standing out. Where the song thrush has a much more dusky, more motley look. Mm -hmm. So you don't get like this pale head contrasting with the body. And finally, are you going to talk about the tail in flight, or are you not going to do that? I don't normally, uh, because then we talk about, because generally with the song thrushes, they just like, dive into the cover. You very yeah. rarely see them out in the open, but missile thrushes often bound away with this big undulating flight, yeah. and you can see the large amounts of white in the tail feather sometimes. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, generally, uh, you know, song thrushes zoop into the cover straight away. Yeah, because it, again, it's the field guides will have this beautiful drawing and it'll show you these little things yeah. on the, on the, the yeah. white on the tail feathers of the missile thrush, but in the field, maybe that's not so easy to. Well, the other thing is the, the underwing. So, like on the missile thrush, it has the yeah. large white armpit, yeah, which really contrasts very well. That's a very attractive look. Do that again. Thank you very much. But on this side, on the song thrush, he mm -hmm. has like orangey armpits. But have I ever seen that in the field? Have I, heck? I've never been able to see that. So, it's like, you know, it's really hard. You know? It's quite the difference between the guides and actual real life. Yeah. Isn't it? Actual, actual field work and yeah. what they say about ID features is, you know, two different things completely. Yeah. Yeah, uh, very briefly, and I didn't prepare you for this, but just something about their voices and how, and yeah. it's already bringing so, uh, the blackbird as well. Yeah, so with the missile thrush, they have this big, loud, rattly <laughs> sound like the old football rattles or a baby yeah. rattle, where the song thrush has this tiny little tsk, tsk, kind of like really a high pitched kind of sound. Mm -hmm. It's not very loud, so it doesn't carry that far. I'm still, when I'm teaching people about bird sounds, I have to really point out that, oh, that tiny little tsk thing. It's the song thrush call, where the missile thrush has this lovely big rattly sound. But when it comes to the, the actual songs, it's the other way around, isn't it? The missile thrush sounds more distant. Yeah. You know, it's quieter. Yeah. And yeah. the song thrush is really bold uh, with repeated yeah. phrases, isn't it? So that's... Uh, yeah, uh, repeating lots of phrases. So they go like, to do, to do, to do, ba dee, 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 where the missile thrush tends to do more of an eerie kind of like... Uh, uh, sound often from a really tall apex of a tree as well yeah things much more in sort of like december january time as well right so the times of year and the, 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 just to bring in the the nickname of the, the missile thrush which i know the old folk name was stormcock which yeah. is that it would be singing before rain or during rain that's right yeah yeah very different so yeah so we'll jump on to now a bit of a juvenile action excellent so it's the time of year for it, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people often get confused and people say, oh, I saw a thrush that was spotted. Was it a song thrush? I'm like, well, probably not. More likely to be a blackbird because right. that's the, the, the cliche. They don't, it's really the difference between is it white spots or dark spots and that sort of thing. So normally, like, just a general over, overview look of them. The blackbird tends to be very dark looking, song thrush very warm coloration and missile thrush very cold in coloration as well. Yeah. And then if we look at the wings, the wings are very distinctive. Blackbird's got very dark, uniform wings. Song thrush has uniform wings again, but sort of like a more sort of like a warmly brown colour. Where the missile thrush has this really nice pale wing panel. I'm really scaly looking all over as well. Mm. So much more distinctive uh, in appearance. Again, we look at the spots on the song thrush, the uh, blackbird are either scaly or pale spots. And with the missile, uh, missile thrush, you've got these large, Bold spots on a very white background, very clean looking. Song thrush tend to be a bit more duskier underneath with these very, very small, neat spots as well. And normally I also like talking about the missile thrush's head because they have this really pale, scaly head yeah. which really stands out as well. Very, uh, very distinctive markings on missile thrush heads, I've always noticed, even in the young ones. Um, what sort of age, from what sort of age will they take on this appearance and how long will it last? So, so they, say they were born earlier this year. Um, at what stage will they be leaving the nest and, and getting out into the open? And then when do they go into their adult plumage? Well, all of them are early breeders. So basically, we could have seen young missile thrush, uh, song thrush, and even blackbird, mostly blackbird and song and the missile thrush, from about the beginning of uh, March onwards, really. Right. So by now, those young will look almost adult-like completely. It'd be very hard to separate those ones from the adults that. Uh, were reared last year. Right. 
So it's a real quick transformation. Some take longer, very hard to judge. You know, some you can see some birds in the autumn that still retain quite a lot of juvenile plumage. And I was looking at a photo earlier of a juvenile uh, missile thrush, and all the body is like an adult. It's got this big sort of like white head on it. So it's just the sequence of the mark really. Very hard, hard to judge, but you know they'll turn around plumage in you know maybe within a, a month or so. And will there be second broods with these birds? Will they have a... Up to three broods if they're lucky. Broods, yeah. Yeah. I mean, stuff like missile thrush often do two broods. So the blackbirds and song thrush. Whether or not they're fortunate enough to get a third one out is uh, hard to know. Really. So you can so you, you, you could be seeing birds of this age any time from sort of late March through uh, all the way through spring and into summer. Yeah. I mean, now we're sort of like the peak time for seeing lots of uh, young birds. I mean, my dunlocks that have bred in my garden yeah. already re fledged their second brood. Right. Well, we've got we've got juvenile uh, great tits, blue tits, and uh, especially a robin um, that's been coming and it's in its juvenile plumage and it yeah. comes quite boldly and it hasn't yet learned and it stays for ages on the on the feeder. Whereas the pet, you know, the adults they'll be on it and off it, yeah. but yeah. The, the young ones kind of stand there going, yeah, quite nice here, quite nice here. And going, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there's a sparrowhawk. Well, exactly. <laughs> it has survived so far and it's a very endearing little thing. Yesterday, I saw juvenile uh, white throats and uh, sedge warblers. Just to show you an idea of when these migrants are coming in, yeah. they pair up, they build their nest, they lay the eggs, hatch the young, and then off to maybe the second or even three broods as well. So some of these birds are really quick at it. Yeah, yeah. excellent. That's all really excellent knowledge, as always. Thank you so much for giving us your time and for those extremely useful diagrams. Um, we'll be back next week with some more bird brain nonsense. Uh, for now, uh, thanks to David, and uh, let's no hope you enjoy your birding uh, sooner rather than later. Thanks very much. Bye bye.